around Asante. So like uh, our service hosts have said, I want to just add a little more about one of the announcements that is about the Silver Club. We've been talking about this for the longest time that we sense that God is asking us to just gather together the people who are in their 50s and above in our congregation. Uh, you are our parents um, and you are a blessing to us. And when I say we, I am talking on behalf of the younger people in our congregation. And even with the sermon series that we've been talking about, that a lot of the things we benefit from in scripture, it's because of people who are willing to tell their stories, including the messy one, so that others would benefit. That in, in this gathering, we are able to process uh, using some of the content that will have the things that we've been through in life and how that is a resource and the blessing for the next generation. So we look forward to seeing you. It will be a breakfast. It will happen once a month. We will host it at the International Leadership University. They have a hall there that we can use, and our church offices also happen to be there. This is meant to be a, an, an, a forum that allows us to get outside the four walls of the church. So it's part of the Beyond Sunday movement. And so we encourage you to invite your friends who are in that space. They are in their 50s and above. Your, sp your friends in your neighborhood or in, in your corporate space who may not even be going to church or belong to a church or they are not even believers, but they are able to understand these conversations of how we've journeyed through life and how we can pass the baton to the next generation. And also, um, we don't necessarily expect that because they come to that forum, that on Sunday they come to church here. That's why it's one of the initiatives of the Beyond Sunday movement, that we have this forum where we can process life together. Uh, I believe people ask certain questions, maybe when you have to parent an adult child, and like when you had a younger child. I don't know what other questions. We look forward to seeing what will come out of this. And I think this is the right time. We've talked about it for a long time, and we look forward to seeing what God will birth out of this. And also to celebrate that we have been extended. We have now more parking. Last Sunday, I mentioned that we are trusting that our neighbors will allow us to park outside JGO. So now we have permission to park outside Ipsos, outside JGO. And as they continue finishing with the pavements outside here and the vet, we should be able to have enough parking, actually similar to the number of cars we were able to park when we were at Mothangari. So let's celebrate God for that. It's been a great concern for us, and we thank God that he's answering us in that way. So this month, we started a sermon series that we've called the Authentic Relationships, which is emphasizing our theme of the year, which is back to basics. We started talking about this theme, and we said we are not going to rush out of it because we are returning back to the lessons that we see in the book of Acts. And... Um, a pandemic or a crisis has a way of revealing cracks in a family, in relationships, and also in the church. And so we realize that there are things that we need to start talking about and go back to some of these basics. And so some of these basics that we are emphasizing this year is actually authentic relationships. So our theme remains back to basics, hashtag authentic relationships. And our theme verse is John chapter 13, verse 35, that talks about how else will people know that you are my disciples except that they see that you love one another and the amplified version says that you have unselfish concern for one that you love each other and you have unselfish concern for one another so I will not be able to do a good recap for three Sundays because that will take a long time. So if you haven't watched or been here to listen to any of these sermons, I really encourage you to find time to listen to week two and three because week two had a great um, summary of week one. So if you do week two and three, you will be fine. Where we talked about initiating authentic relationships, we ask each other why is it that it's often difficult to experience authenticity in our relationships and you all had different things to say. We learned from the mistakes of the disciples that on this one week, the Passion Week before Jesus went to the cross, between the Palm Sunday and Easter Sunday, they experienced so much. You would think that these events took place within years, but it was only one week that the people that were closest to Jesus turned against him. When he was in need and he would tell them, I'm in distress, please pray for me, he would go three times and he would find that they were sleeping. 
we see them denying Jesus in different ways. Because at some point when he was on the cross, he had 12 disciples, but at that point he only had John with him. 11 of the people that he had poured into for three years, he ate with them, he journeyed with them, were not willing to stand with him in his toughest moments. We see Judas discussing with the chief priest how much money he was going to get because he was committed to denying Jesus. But on the other hand, we see that when Jesus came back to life, he started demonstrating what authentic relationships is all about. He didn't come and point fingers. He gathered them together and he helped them to address the gaps that were there in terms of their relationship and the mission. And so for 40 days, he sat with them and he had conversations with them. And then he commissioned them. He told them, go ye into all the world, starting with Jerusalem to the uttermost part of the world. Of the world. And he told them, do not be in a hurry to do this because you need to wait on the Holy Spirit spirit to empower you so that you can go. Because some of these things, unless you get to a place where the Holy Spirit empowers you a certain way, it is not enough to say that this is the theme of the year. It takes the Holy Spirit equipping you a certain way to be able to enter into some of these spaces. Because authentic relationships are not necessarily easy. He demonstrated this lesson even before he went on the cross, where the one illustration and the final lesson that he gave his disciples was seen in him washing their feet, teaching them that if you forget anything else I've taught you in three years, learn how to serve one another. Go to very uncomfortable spaces. Get personal with each other because that's what washing of the feet represents. And in last Sunday, we talked about the test of authentic relationships, that it's not enough to know it, that it gets tested. And we talked about the prodigal sons. We had the one who was looking for freedom, left home and went away. But then he realized actually he had left the place that had freedom, even though it looked like it had rules like of waiting, you get your inheritance at this point. Then we had the other one who thought he did things the way they were supposed to be. But as the father came back to him and said, stop complaining because you have been with me and everything that I have is actually yours. And so from those, from, from, from these two sons, we learned that um, our God has upside down principles. That for the one who had done him wrong, in fact, for you to ask for your inheritance before your father was dead, in that culture, it was as good as declaring your parent dead. And we see the response of the father that he went running. He didn't even let this guy reach home. When he saw him coming back, he ran towards him. And we are saying that when it comes to authentic relationships, the principles are upside down. Because usually when someone has offended you, the one thing you want to do is not to run towards them. When Jesus came back, one of the three times he appeared before his disciples, he found them that they had gone back to fishing. The first thing he did is not to say that you guys dropped the faith and you went back to the things I had called you out for. The Bible says that that night they had caught nothing, but he went and he helped them to fish. And that day they had enough, more than enough. And perhaps the lesson there was for them to realize you can't keep running from the things that God is saying. He has provided in this way, even though you don't understand that you go and do it your own way. Just like the prodigals and you'll go and find you can only eat the pig's food. And just like the disciples, you will realize you'll be there the whole night and catch nothing. And after that, we see him helping them to make breakfast. He didn't judge them. Those are upside down principles that he would meet them where they were. And then he would not stop there. He would journey with them because the same Jesus now got into that place where he had what I would call a tough conversation or tough love conversation with Peter and asking Peter, after our Meshiba, they've eaten. Do you really love me? And Peter wasn't getting it until the third time where he understood that Jesus was telling him, you don't stick into faith, into the faith in Christ Jesus or to the matters of God because it's um, working for you. That even when it's not working for you, you stick there. It's unconditional love. And when Peter understood that, the Bible says that he says, yes, I love you. And God told him, feed my sheep. And this is the Peter we see in the book of Acts where he would pass and th people would get healed because of his shadow. He's the Peter who wrote first Peter and second Peter. He left us with doctrines that we can stand by as the church today. 
What would have happened if Jesus had given up to these people, if Jesus was not willing to meet them where they are? And so I was to talk about authentic relationships. That is a summary of two or three sermons, actually. And so I really encourage that you go back and watch so that you're able to build up from there. So today we are doing the next topic, which is naked and not ashamed culture. This is a culture that is necessary if we are going to... Um, Understand these basics of authentic relationships. Genesis chapter 2, verse 25. Genesis chapter 2, verse 25 says, <coughs> Genesis 2, 25, and they were both naked, the man and his wife, and they were not ashamed. That is the last verse on the account of creation because man um, was the last one to be created. And they both were naked and then he got a wife. And they were both naked and the man and his wife and they were not ashamed. Chapter 3 verse 1 to 13 of Genesis talks about the temptation and the fall of man. And I want us to read Genesis 3, 1 to 13, which says, Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat, you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. And they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden uh, in the cool of day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you that you should not eat? Then the man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I ate. And the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. We observe four things from this text which adds to our list of authentic relationships and why authentic relationships are usually difficult. So we've seen that God demonstrated in this text a rhythm of independence and togetherness. The text says the man and woman had God when he came to walk in the garden with them in the cool of the day. Meaning God was not always walking around with them. He had given them some freedom to enjoy the garden. He was not... Um, he was not uh, micromanaging Adam and Eve in the garden. He told them what to do. He gave them the rule of engagement. And then he would come in the evening and hang out with them. So they had the freedom. But they didn't see like they had it until the enemy came. Just like the prodigal son who was at home with everything provided for but had to go to this space that had no accountability, to this space where it had no rules. And so the same thing with, uh, with Eve. It was easier to listen to the enemy because she didn't understand that she actually had freedom, that she had a God who created her, gave her everything, gave them one rule of engagement, and he would come hang out with them. And so we see that God had actually, at creation, allowed a rhythm of independence and togetherness with the people that he created. But number two, and Adam and Eve were naked, but they were not ashamed. Do you know that this is the deepest of human longings? 
to be in a place where you can open up, where you can be known, as difficult as it is. When you find that place and you are accepted and you're given space to become, it is the deepest longing and need for every human being, even though we fight it. This is true about children, teenagers, as well as adults. But because they removed the covering that God had given them, and the covering had, that had been given to them came in the name of a rule. It was do eat from anything else, but do not eat from this particular team. So they, they, the devil came and told them, oh, he's telling you that because you're going to become like him, just eat, and then you will have the knowledge of good and evil. What they didn't know is that actually having that knowledge of good and evil was going to mess them up. So God had provided a covering that, that was a reserve of God only, but they were meant to enjoy everything else that he had provided. So part of what happens when we date someone or make a friend or see a therapist is the progressive disclosure of who we are. It is done cautiously. The awareness that there are parts of us that are not too attractive makes us be very hesitant. And the thought of hiding or being extra cautious was not there with Adam and Eve until they removed that covering. So whenever you see yourself struggling to open up, to let somebody else um, know your dark side, it started here. It started with Adam and Eve not settling for what God had said was enough for them, but them wanting to go to this thing that the enemy had said they were missing out on. They left what was actual freedom because they needed to go for extra freedom, which put them in bondage. And as a result, generations after generations have struggled as a result of that one act. The third thing we say that they failed to trust God's rule of engagement. As a result, they fell into sin. This was the birth of shame and guilt. They looked at each other and they saw danger. So they covered themselves with fig leaves. They wanted to hide. And this is an important part of the Christian doctrine about the fallenness of humankind. This is where it started. The concealing of our wrongs, lying, shifting blame. You can see that Adam says, but it was Eve. And Eve says, it was serpent. Is that what we see even with our little children. They don't need to attend a class to, to learn how to shift blame or to lie that they ate sugar or whatever you see. We see this in our relationship. This is what makes authentic relationships difficult. Nothing else but sin. So when it comes, the fourth thing, when it comes to authentic relationships, we realize that some of the principles are very difficult. Some, sometimes people wonder, why did God forbid the man and woman from eating from one tree? If there had been no such rule, they, would, they, they never would have disobeyed. But it is in this detail of the story, God is doing something of fundamental importance of, about community. God is giving man and woman a choice. True community is never forced on anyone. You choose to be part of a small group. You choose to be part of a fellowship like this because you have an option to stick to digital church for life because it has been introduced to us. So true community cannot be forced on people. But God is giving man and woman a choice. The creator knew that human beings needed rules of engagement for them to live peaceful lives. But human beings chose to remove the covering that the rule of engagement had given them. It's not always that God says, don't go there, don't do this. Doesn't mean that he doesn't like us or he doesn't love us. He's actually protecting us. Christianity is much simpler than we imagine. If only we would stick by what the things that God tells us. And so this story teaches us that sin kills relationships. Start, it, it, started, it started by killing or distracting their relationship with God. Now they started hiding from him. Then God provided through his son, Jesus Christ, his death on the cross, so that we can confidently say that not understanding our identity in Christ will keep us living far below our rights and privileges in him. That's why it's important to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Because it's at that point that we start our journey of restoration, of being sanctified and constantly being taken back to the place where we belong. Re 
authentic relationships are very difficult outside of God. When our identity is in Christ is not intact, we, just like Adam and Eve, find that it is common for man to shift blame, to walk in shame or guilt, or to hide from God. This has ruined many marriages and families. Shifting blame to our leaders becomes the normal thing. People post anything they want to say about our political leaders, no matter what we think about them. It could be our opportunity to take responsibility as the church of what we have not done to govern our nation well. It's not just about our political leaders. Jesus knew when by the time he was washing his disciples' feet, at the beginning of that text that we read, I think the second Sunday, he understood who he was in Christ. And he was willing to go into that space where he even washed the feet of Judas. And he knew that Judas had already had conversations with the chief priest ready to betray him. And he told Judas while serving him Holy Communion, Judas, whatever you do, do quickly. Yet he washed his feet. So scripture tells us that when Adam and Eve had God's footstep, instead of being filled with joy that God is coming to hang out with us the way he's used to, you know, the way a child is always happy, daddy is coming home. The Bible says that they were flooded with shame and fear. Hiding came into being and after the fall, it is, and it's often motivated by shame. It involves pretending and deceiving. It always diminishes our contribution to community. Because when we stop enjoying uh, or, uh, or knowing the joy of being in this place where we are transparent and open, the opposite is that we pretend and we deceive even ourselves that the person I present to people that this is who I am, whether on social media or in church or out there when you're with your family or when you're holding hands with your spouse, that we deceive ourselves that that person, the image I've given people about myself is the one, yet it's not. So God at this point asked Adam, where are you? This was not about Adam's geographical location because he's God, he's all knowing, he knew everything. He was not asking him for information because our God knows everything. He was giving him an opportunity to reveal himself, to own. God had the audacious grace to treat Adam as a person, even when Adam had defied him. God does this because no one, not even he himself, can get another person to be in a relationship by force. So he had to ask Adam, where are you? Please ask your neighbor, where are you? Ask them, who knows where you are? I know you're in church, but we're talking about our inner lives. Who are you? Where are you? And who knows where you are? Some of us struggle with letting God know where we are. And this is, it's only in passing this test that we are able to pass the authentic relationships test. Because if you cannot open up to God, how will you even manage to open up to a fellow human being? We see that with these two, instead of taking up responsibility, they started blaming each other. And that's what we see that many of us do easily. Yet scripture reminds us in Revelation 12, chapter 12, that when the enemy was thrown down here on earth, he understood his time was short and he is moving with fury. So when it comes to relationships, the enemy will ensure that we live in this place of deception, that we live in this place where we manage our image at any cost because he wants to use that to accelerate hate in the family. He wants to make sure many people don't get out of mental illness. He just wants to see that many, many marriages are breaking. He is moving with fury because he has understood that his time is short. So we need to know that one of the marks that distinguishes a healthy church from a cult is that in an authentic community, community people are never coerced or manipulated into self-disclosure. The word of God goes out and they give you an opportunity 
to respond, knowing that just like the scripture we read last Sunday, that there is a lot of celebration in heaven when one person repents, meaning they move away from the things that God has prohibited and they move closer to the things that God has commanded. One of the marks I have said is about um, manip people are not manipulated into self-disclosure. So you can force someone into conformity, but you cannot force them into community. So we give you opportunities to join a group, but we don't force you. We encourage you. We say it's a godly thing to work in community. It's a godly thing to meet with a team that you serve with, whether you're not doing something, to, to embrace the place of being as a team. So that you don't just meet because we are doing this, but you can meet because you, you just want to enjoy each other's com company. Fear, blaming each other, hiding started after Adam and Eve had sinned. So they started hiding from each other to know and to be known, which had always been the greatest joy of the human race, now becomes the greatest fear of the human race. The problem is the more skillful we are at impression management, the more we are trapped in our true aloneness. And so we, when we talk about back to basics, it demands that we fight harder to leave out the principles that we see in the book of Acts. Because those are the basics that we are trying to, to apply. Because the, the early church taught us those things. The, writers of the, book, or the writer of the book of Acts says that they met with glad and sincere hearts. The early church, they met with glad and sincere hearts. There was no impression management. Someone would come and say, this is my need. And the next person would say, okay, let's meet it. You remember, I've mentioned this so many times, to a point they would sell land to meet the need of the next person. We need to experience the freedom and relief of not trying to convince anyone that you are smarter or better than you are. Church should be a place where you come as you are. At the end of the second installation of this Ammon series, we talked about the three stages of developing uh, authenticity, which is a good tool for us to keep going back to, to just see the difference and to just be able to know where you are in your different relationships. So today we want to talk about three things that, um, uh, that, that helps us get into this culture of naked and not ashamed. The first one, so we will dwell more on the third one. The first one is guarded communication. Um, guarded communication is useful if you're trying to create a culture of a group of people or a community that are not naked and not ashamed. Proverbs chapter 20 verse 19 says, A gossip can never keep a secret. Be careful around people who talk too much. There is a place for guarded communication, even in this whole uh, authentic relationships conversation. But this is, it's not, authentic relationships is not found in that place, but there's a place for guarded communication. As a church, we are to avoid gossip if we are to embrace the naked and not ashamed culture. Christians are notorious for gossip in the name of prayer items or concern. This is the sin that we are talking about that does not allow God to do what he intended to do for the church. So people will come and say, I am very concerned. Uh, you know, some, I even heard that the reason this is happening is because one, two, and three. Even so and so told me the same thing. So it's like you are affirming. Hi, hi, Kumbe, this is true. This earth is hard. That's, that's how we talk. And it looks like it's normal to live in a space where people talk like that. Myself included. But if we are going to be an authentic church, we have to go to scripture and agree on something that the next time someone comes to you and says that so and so was telling me this about you or about the other person, tell them, please, can we organize to meet the three of us? Just in case we have some assumptions that we need to clarify. Because if someone is not willing to bring in the third person, it means they have misrepresented that person. But how many times have you been told by somebody something about somebody else and you didn't ask them, can we ask them about this? Because if you allow it to end there, you, 
you and the gossiper same WhatsApp. It is certain that they have done something wrong. If, if it is certain that they have done something wrong, then always go by the Matthew 18 principle, which says from verse 15 to 17, if another believer sins against you, go privately and point out the offense. If the other person listens and confesses it, you have won the person back. And it ends there. The e-group doesn't need to know. Your children, when you're having dinner, doesn't have to know because you talk openly. That is not the openness we are talking about. Verse 16 says, but if you are unsuccessful, take one or two others with you and go back again so that everything you say may be confirmed by true or three witnesses. If the pastor still refuses to listen, take your case to the church. Then if he or she won't accept the church's decision, treat that person as a pagan or a corrupt tax collector. Do you know how you're supposed to treat a pagan or a corrupt tax collector? You are supposed to pray for them and love them a lot so that one day they will understand what you know. And unfortunately, people have misunderstood this scripture to mean throw that person out of church. I've seen people being excommunicated from churches because of this scripture. So if you're not sure what is the right thing to do, pray for people. This approach is useful, especially when we do not have a relationship with the person who we are concerned about. A relational capital is therefore key when it comes to correcting someone. Relational capital is an investment in a person's life that forms the basis for influence. Who would you give permission to challenge you? A person that you just met or someone who has invested in you? So that's why we are talking about guarded communication. All conversations are not your conversations. Therefore, in the spirit of building authentic community, where the naked and not ashamed culture is, we must know the people that we should not open up to. We must know when to hold people accountable, when we should do it with one-on-one, -on -one, and when to involve others. And lastly, when, where there is no relationship, things can backfire on you, and therefore a lot of wisdom is needed. Number two, the second thing that can help us achieve this culture of naked and not ashamed is everyday authenticity. For the young people in the house, I hear that one of the defining moments in any dating relationship, I don't know how true it is, is the first time the man sees the woman without makeup. Is this true? Even young at heart can answer. Makeup is the art of facial management. You don't want the guy to look at your actual so we go for plumping, lipsticks, make thin lips look fuller. We go for makeup tricks that instantly make our eyes look bigger. Or what do we call those things for editing photos on Instagram and elsewhere? Filters. We make sure our eyes are bigger. I don't know what men do. Maybe they borrow a friend's car. I don't know what they do to please a girl. You see, it's not just our physical blemishes that we try to hide. Most of us work pretty hard to conceal the flaws that mar our character. Have you mastered the art of hiding behind small talk? Humor? You know those people who laugh, they, they crack a joke to dilute something they don't want, a conversation they don't want to get into. You hide by withdrawing from people or refusing to work in community. And so in this particular space, a lot of people are using this to remain online. They are not ready for community. Some of us use our intelligence as a veil. Some of us veil ourselves in business, and ironically, some of us veil ourselves in spirituality. We may see things that sound po uh, impossible to argue with, um, yet our words are just but, you know, modes of protection and not bridges towards a relationship. There is one of the books that I really recommend to everybody about spiritual disciplines, I forget, by Richard Foster. In one of the disciplines I talks about, which is the discipline of silence, 
It says, let him who cannot be alone beware of community. Let him who is not in community beware of being alone. <coughs> Each by itself has profound pitfalls and perils. One who wants fellowship without solitude plunges into the void of words and feelings, and one who seeks solitude without fellowship perishes in the abyss of vanity, self-infatuation, and despair. Let me read it again. Let him, he who cannot be alone, be aware of community. That in refusing to deal with some things in your life, you constantly are with people from one mission to another, from one prayer meeting to the next. Let him who is not in community beware of being alone. That you also are not ready for community because of you, you're not ready for people to know you, so you prefer to be alone. Each by itself has profound pitfalls and perils. One who wants fellowship without solitude plunges into the void of words and feelings, and one who seeks solitude without fellowship perishes in the abyss of vanity, self-infatuation, and despair. That's a quote from a book called Life Together by Dietrich Bonhoeffer. So I'll ask you a question, what is your veil? What is your veil? What do you easily do? Sometimes we don't even know, and that's why we go to counselors. That's why we ask the people closest to us to tell us, because people around you have observed you a certain way, especially your family members, your friends, or your colleagues. If you give them permission to speak and to answer this question, the things you used to hide from, to run away from accountability, they will tell you. This conversation is actually not easy for pastors or leaders because we often try to live up to the expectations that human beings have of us constantly tempting us, tempting us to live a lie. So you regret that you are not in all the meetings. I'm talking about myself, but I'm learning. But it is true about many pastors. Personally, I'm learning to pursue the courage to express what I truly value, enjoy, and love, even when people don't approve of it. I'm learning to acknowledge my mistakes when necessary, and also in the right context, because that's what I see all of scripture demonstrating. The things we benefit from about the disciples is because they choose not to conceal. The irony of masks is that although we wear them to make other people think well of us, they are drawn to us only when we take them off. <clears throat> if you want to be in a relationship where people share deeply with you, there is one single step you need to take. Disclosure begets disclosure. This leads us to our area of focus today, which is the third thing that helps us in creating a, um, a culture of um, naked and unashamed. We've talked about guarded communication and everyday authenticity. But now we want to talk about deep disclosure with a few trusted friends. And I want us to read from the book of Mark, chapter 2, verse 1 to 5. Um, part of this was borrowed <coughs> from a book that is called Everybody's Normal Until You Get to Know Them by John Ottberg. You can get this book at Guess Week. Mark chapter 2, verse 1 to 5. The Bible says, And again he entered Capernaum after some days, and it was hard that he was in the house. Immediately many gathered together so that there was no longer room to receive them, not even near the door. And he preached the word to them. Then they came to him bringing a paralytic who, had, who was carried by four men. And when they could not come near him because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. So when they had broken through, they let down the bed on which the paralytic was lying. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven you. You can only imagine what life was like for this man, who people had to help all the time. 
He did not know the sense of independence, but he had amazing friends. You know, we live in a world that is not gracious to people who can't run fast, you know? Um, including the church. I admire churches that have gotten to a place where they interpret what's going on for the deaf. They think about um, people who can't walk, you know, the cripples, and they create proper pavements for them. We live in a world where even in such things, even in the city, you walk in the city of Nairobi and you see bad, you know, bad uh, manholes and you wonder, even for me who can skip it, if I had not seen this, it was going to break my, my feet, you know, but how much more for the people who are in a space like that? We live in a world that is not, not gracious to people who can't move with our speed. The ancient world was even worse or even harsher because the Greeks regularly disposed of newborn infants with physical anomalies. They used to kill them. It was not allowed. They were not allowed to live. Yet here we see a little band of men who refuse to let any obstacle stop them. In the face of formidable obstacles, social stigma, inconvenience, financial pressure, a high cost of time and energy, they chose to become friends. The thing is, people rarely drift into deep community. You don't just find yourself in it. It costs. And you see, one of the most countercultural statements that we see again in the book of Acts is that it says, the church met together daily. I don't know how many of you are always struggle every time you see that. You're like, wait, these guys have jobs and families. They had found a way of making everything community because the church had, had no four walls. So wherever they met in the name of the Lord, whether in the marketplace or wherever, the church met together daily. So we try to create a first century community on a 20, 21st century timetable, and it doesn't work. I shared with you a dream last Sunday about how God spoke to me about moving with speed. And maybe some of you are like me. Our biggest barrier to deep connectedness for most of us is actually the pace of our lives. Because the requirement for true intimacy is chunks of unhurried time. If you think you can fit a deep community into the cracks of an overloaded schedule, Think again. Wise people do not try to microwave friendships, parenting, leadership, or marriage. You cannot do community in a hurry. You can't listen in a hurry. You cannot mourn in a hurry with those who mourn. I want us to conclude, and I want to invite our worship team to come on stage. Our theme verse for this year is by this everyone we know that you are my disciples if you have love and unselfish concern for one another <clears throat> i have two quotes here that i saw and i like them one of them says being hard is so close to being loved for the average person they are almost indistinguishable being hard is so close to being loved for the average person they are almost indistinguishable I realize that it's difficult to be a good listener if I'm always moving from one thing to the other. You just tell some yeah, we'll meet, we should plan. It never happens. From experience, you know that those who care for you become present to you. When they listen, they listen to you. When they speak, you know they speak to you, not at you. Their presence is a healing presence because they accept you on your terms. Again, it's easier to struggle with that. Accept them on your terms. And they encourage you to take your own life seriously. You know, in the year 2020, we buried a young person who was on the band. And he committed suicide. It's not because we didn't have access to each other physically. Maybe we just never had him. Maybe we just never showed interest to know him.
You see, many people lack great friends just because of the simple reason that they have never made pursuing community a high priority. You can't carry somebody's mat in a hurry because everybody comes with a mat. Please tell your neighbor, everybody comes with a mat. So we said everybody's normal until you get to know them. That's why everybody has a mat, including your pastors. Because the enemy has also lied to us that we should expect certain things of ministers of God to a point we can't pray for them. It becomes easier to criticize. Let the mat stand as a picture of human brokenness and imperfection. It's what is not normal about me or about you. So I have a question. Who carries your mat for you? This guy had the four friends. Who carries your mat for you? Who do you show your weaknesses and your struggles to? Or are you caught up in impression management? Does your e-group really, really know you? Who do you allow to see your brokenness? If you had a 3 a.m. crisis, a crisis at 3 a.m., who would you wake up? How many of us have ever gone to a counselor? Or do we think it's for weak people? Because that's what culture has told us. It's for people who are headed to Madare. It's the in-between. Who can you borrow 50 bob to to return at the end of the month? You see, it's easier to borrow 10,000. You still look okay. 10,000, they will manage. It means they are interacting with money somewhere. But if you're not interacting with money somewhere, you actually go and borrow 50 bob and say, I'll give you at the end of the month. This week we've had reports of people who have committed suicide in our country. Do you think it's because they were not surrounded by people? Some of them are well known to many of us. They are actually famous. I don't know what caused them to get to that place. It could be they were unwell. And I want to believe it's actually always unwell. That's why people are careful to say they died by suicide, not they committed suicide. I'll share part two of my story that I shared last week. I don't know how many of you have ever experienced burnout. But when burnout is not taken care of, it becomes a mental illness. And you can actually get to a place of no return unless God helps you. And so in August 2020, I remember I could tell that I was not okay. A part of me knew that I would post in some WhatsApp groups and I could tell Leonie me overwhelm what. Because I had this energy that didn't make sense even to me. But I also had days where I wanted to see nobody. And when I, I observed that about myself, I, I was afraid. I thought, could it be? I usually have a mental illness and I've never known. Remember in 2020, a lot of us found ourselves in that space just because of being locked in the house. Because I live alone and I, they, I, I took lo much longer to decide to interact with people out of the fear of COVID. But I didn't realize what being alone was doing to me Yet I have not resolved the things of moving with speed. So a lot of things were coming together. I remember several years I went to the doctor and I was told it's acid reflux and they would give you a, a lot of medicine. You know, uh, then they would say, this one, you just need to not be stressed and you'll be fine. And so the doctor would say, it's stress, it's stress. And I thank God that I belong to a community that gave me permission to go on sabbatical. 
No, let's tell people, you can be that space, but you're not picking papers on the roads like a mad person. So there's a part of me that was very present, present that I would even preach. There's a part of me that when I s argued about something, I knew what I was saying, but the space I was in could not allow everyone to receive it, to receive what I was saying. I always tell people, even the mad person who is on the road that borrows U50 bob at the traf you know, that junction, for the um, junction mall, there's, there's a guy there who always asks you, sister, how come he doesn't call me brother? There's a part of him that is present, you get. But you can be in this place where I, it, things are interpreted as personality or character issues, and that could be part of it and it shouldn't be excused. But could it be we are a community that does not know how to interpret when somebody really needs our help? We don't have to get to a place where people near us commit suicide or give up on their faith and walk away because instead of asking them, I've noticed this pattern about you, are you okay? Have you considered seeing a counselor? Who are you talking to? We bash them. And that's why some people can't even run to church for help. So I want to invite us to stand with the knowledge that there is no ideal community, not your family, not this church, not the place where you work. In that story of the man who was healed, the people who are most spiritual, the scribes, they started debating in their hearts, why is he healing him? And God is calling the church out of that place. We cannot be like those people where somebody needs help, but we are the first ones to bash them because that was the response of the scribes. And verse 8 says of Mark 2, immediately Jesus being fully aware of their hostility and knowing in his spirit that they were thinking this, he said to them, why are you debating and arguing about these things in your heart? Because they didn't even voice it. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, that you gave us an opportunity this month to talk about authentic relationships. It is possible that many of us who stand here this morning or who are online are actually surrounded by many people, but they are alone. And it's sin that has gotten us to this place where when we don't understand the covering that we have in these things that we think are difficult, opening up to other people, doing the things that Jesus asked us to do in community, that we think we are pursuing our own freedom, but just like Adam and Eve, we can only remain in a place where we shift blame. Who got me to this place? If only my parents parented me better, and we forget to see the true restoration that, and healing that comes in embracing the things that you're speaking to us right now. Again, you told the disciples, before you rush to go and try and do these things, wait on the Holy Spirit. He will empower you. He will show you how to navigate in relationships. He will show you how to interpret the behavior of the person that is next to you. So you won't be quick to conclude that they have a personality issue. You won't be quick to conclude that they are lacking in character. But you will be filled with compassion and desire to pray for them and to stand with them. So Lord, we are those people on both sides. We, do, we need to receive and we need to give. And that's why we come to you recognizing that you are the constant in this conversation. That you'd guide us when it's a moment to receive. That we will not be afraid to open up and to allow other people. Because this guy, when he was brought to Jesus by his friends, 
they brought him so that he could find healing but they didn't know that the greatest thing he needed was spiritual healing and so Jesus responded by saying your sins are forgiven Sometimes God does not respond to the needs that are bothering us in our families and in our relationships the way we think. He just says, get closer to me. Come, I will wipe your sins away. And we don't understand that it's in him doing that that he solves all the other problems. So this year we come before your presence, Jehovah, desiring that we will know you more. Desiring that, God, you will wash our sins away. That you will help us, my Father. That some of the things we have normalized in our communities and in our conversations that do not glorify your holy name, we will say not to them for the glory and honor of your holy name. So Holy Spirit of God, as we go into a new week, we ask, would you empower us and give us what we need, my Father, to be a blessing to the people that we come across this week, to prepare for the fasting and prayer time that we are starting as a family of believers. With this knowledge, it shall empower us to pray differently. All for the glory and honor of your holy name. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen and amen. God bless you. Have a lovely week and see you next Sunday.